This is Breaking Down Security, and I am Brian Brake. Welcome back, listener. This is Brian and Mr. Betcher for the first time in a couple of weeks on uh, Breaking Down Security. Yeah, good to be back. Nice, nice. So um, <clears throat> you, uh, Mr. Betcher, are just back from vacation. Well, you didn't. Uh, you they call it hacker summer camp. Um, but you were in Vegas for uh, Black Hat and DevCon then, yeah. Yep, and B sides. Very nice. Okay. Uh, well, let me ask you a question. So you guys were talking at Arsenal about um about log md yeah log md yeah so how uh how did that go it went great um it was something that we hadn't done before just to kind of talk and have people walk by kind of like a sideshow sort of thing and um um we weren't prepared for the just give a five minute spiel and move on right that the uh, audience would stop by come look at our booth or whatever and have us you know try to get them interested in the product or whatnot and then if not they'd move on so so yeah it was a good experience instead of just giving like a one hour talk it was more like a five minute pitch right here's what the tool is here's how it can help you here's why we you know you should look into it and that sort of thing so um, you know, lessons learned. Uh, we didn't start out too good, but after the first half hour, um, things got rolling and, and it started moving, moving along pretty well. So it so, was different. So wait, you said this was a, um, this was a, uh, you said if people would come by and if they were interested in what you were having to say, then they would stick, stick around. A- but other than that, they'd give you like the, the gong show treatment and they'd just walk off. Yeah, I mean, people would stop by because they wanted to know, um, you know, they wanted to look at all the Arsenal tools, right, that were going on at the time. So they would go from table to table. Um, and, uh, you know, if if they seemed interested, they would stick around, ask questions, things like that. Oh, okay. I thought it was, it was something totally, completely different. I thought it was like you had, you know, a, a, a bunch of people there for kind of like a pseudo vendor talk so that obviously was not the case no there was one room with seats i guess the um and people would go in and sit in that room but the rest of us had tables i don't know i think it was something around eight uh different tools at the same time so they had about an hour and 15 minutes or so to um to be there okay Okay. So when once your hour was up, they would they would say, "All right, get out of here. We'll get ready for the next uh, group." Did right. you get feedback or anything on how you delivered your application or your presentation or anything like that? Well, Josh was there, and uh, he checked us out for a while and and uh, gave us a few pointers. You know, uh-huh. you know, he, he he was like, "Dude, you gotta you gotta make this quick." Right. Oh, so, yeah. so we sped it up and, and, uh, we, we got the gist of it after the first half hour or so. And That's so cool. it seemed to, to go really smooth after that, but it was so, a rough start, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What was the, what was the consensus from your, uh, from the people? I mean, what kind of questions did they ask you? Did they give you any ideas on, you know, improvements or, you know, uh, you know, criticism about the, the product itself? No, they didn't, uh, they didn't have any criticism or, or, um, um, you know, pointers or anything like that because they didn't know about the tool. They hadn't used it yet. Uh, this okay. was almost like a sales pitch type. Here, Here's what it's about. Here's why you need it, things like that. So we had a lot of people that were different backgrounds, right? We sure. had pen testers. We had people from the feds. Uh, we had compliance people. And we had um, students who were interested in security, right? So they would stop by. I'd ask them, you know, what do you do? I had some people say, you know, oh, I work for the federal government and uh, I really like, you know, this tool. I want to, you know, test it out at work. We had um, one guy who said, no, two guys who said, I can't tell you what I do. I was like, okay, Uh, well, if you're this, then you can use it for this reason. If you're 
do this if you're you know you can use it for your clients etc cetera, etc cetera. so mm -hmm. it was it was nice to uh, meet a lot of people had a couple people at Arsenal come by um, they said they like the podcast they listen etc you know so that was Very good nice. uh, met a few listeners there and and okay. a few listeners at the convention itself right very cool so this was the first year you'd ever gone to, to Black Hat and DEF CON and, and all those. So uh, what, was your, uh, what was your opinion of it? Because I've heard some other things from some friends and, uh, and colleagues uh, for, for Black Hat and DEF CON. Well, it was just um, massive. I really liked um, B-Sides, how they had a lot of talks. Um, they had a vendor type area that was um, not too crowded. And, uh, you know, they had, uh, you know, it was a typical B-Sides, right? And, but it was just bigger than, than all the rest. It was, um, it was in a nice venue. So that was good. I didn't, I wasn't able to go to any of the talks. I was more like hallway con in that one. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, they had a, a booklet with, you know, all the talks on it. It was, it was quite massive. They had some defensive talks on there as well. Nice. Um, Black Hat was kind of more, I don't know, vendor-ish, if you will, as far mm -hmm. as, oh man, they had just a massive vendor area, just went all out, and who knows how much they paid for it. I think the smallest ones were probably about 15000 Oh. Oh, um, you know, God. for the couple of days. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And uh, it was, uh, it was, it was a little more. It was a lot more corporate -y than B sides, obviously. Okay. So, um, and and the talks were good. I went to a couple of talks at Black Hat. Um, they had uh, very big venues, en enough so that most of the people that attended could attend each talk. Mm -hmm. So I, I think they oversized them in that respect. And Black Hat's put on by a, a company. I think they. I don't know the name of the company, but they. I, I don't know they own magazines or something so so yeah it's a it's a company that runs um black hat okay so you know it it was nice they they should be nice because of the amount they charge for people and vendors and things like that so so i, I guess in that respect you get what you pay for now we did crash um um ben 10 and uh, Dave Kennedy's class so we went in there they invited us in um, you know they mentioned uh, log MD in the class so we came on in and gave them some you know merchandise or whatnot and cool. I, I sat in there for about 20 minutes until they you know it was time for us to go in front and, yeah. and uh, you know say a few words and I gotta say man they uh, that class <laughs> they did a good job because they um, take what they know, which is quite a bit, and and take little slivers of their knowledge that mm -hmm. that give the participants in their class like the most value, and they talk about them. They say, "Here's how a hacker would exploit this or use this," and then here's how you detect that kind of thing. So, um, I think it's has a lot to do with um, binary defense and and how they work that company and, and uh, kind of their methodology. And, uh, you know, they take all that knowledge and have a class for people. I think it was very valuable. And I, I learned things in that, you know, 20 minutes that I was just sitting there waiting to go up. It was, uh, it was a good class. So there's a lot of value there. Very nice. Um, yeah, I guess it's, uh, what, it's not really a surprise, but uh, are you and Michael going to be speaking at, De at DerbyCon? I know that LogMD got accepted for a stable talk or track talk, or is that just Michael doing it? Uh, just Michael. I don't know which. I think he submitted a couple of talks, so I'm not sure which one it was. I don't even know if he knows. It has to be posted or something. So Yeah, well, they posted it as of yesterday, which was August 13th. I didn't get accepted at my talk, only because I really don't remember what I put in for a talk, and... Uh, I've never talked at a big event event before, so uh, I wasn't really expecting a lot of out of it. So uh, you know, getting accepted. So 
Uh, but yeah, on according to Michael Goff on his Facebook page, LogMD was accepted for a talk. So I don't know if it's a track or stable. So um, you know, congratulations to you both for that. So there you go. Yeah, and I don't know if um, if he's going to talk about Windows logging or if he's going to talk about you know finding hackers or finding malware. I'm not sure which talk it was, but yeah, he did get accepted. So we'll. I have to wait till it's posted on the website to find out which one was accepted because he submitted more than one. Yeah. So yeah, okay. it wasn't just about LogMD, but basically, you know, here's how how I do this, right? And and probably he'll slip in LogMD. You know, here's how yeah. LogMD can help you with finding well, hackers or whatnot. Okay. Yeah. He said honored to be selected to speak at DerbyCon again this year. See you there. Hugs to all www.logmd so uh yeah you're right maybe he didn't uh, maybe yeah he did submit more than one i guess that's the that's the important thing that's how you get you know better chances of entry you have to submit more than one talk so um so what was some of the what was some of the bad thing uh well i don't say bad things but the the negative things about uh of black hat and defcon i mean other than some of the stuff i heard about the crowds and you know, uh, apparently some people ha- are still waiting in line for their badge. Uh, you know, they they were spending hour, an hour, hour and a half to, in line to get a get a badge, and they ran out of badges on the first day. That was just a minor thing. Um, you know, what 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 were some of the other things that you uh, you had noticed at, at your first, you know, hacker spr- summer break? Well, yeah, they did have issues with the badges um, that everybody heard about. Yeah. Um, the badges at DEF CON are, are puzzles, right? Yep. So you have to figure out what this badge does, what it contains, and, and you know, there are clues everywhere, you know, in the in the lanyard, on the badge itself, hanging up in the, the hallways, on the floors. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a puzzle, a challenge to figure out. So they had a certain number of badges there, and if you got there early, you got your your badge right and then they ran out um i think well from what i heard they had an issue at customs you know Uh, they were imported and a bunch of them were held up there and then on the second day of defcon i think we could trade in our paper badges for real badges unfortunately the the uh, second batch wasn't vetted through so they didn't have the firmware on them and uh things like that but you still got a badge right so it's you know it's still a cool looking badge or whatnot with the components and stuff so yeah so yeah yeah. that they had issues there and uh, a lot of people were complaining but you know it is what it is Mm -hmm. right i i was able to trade in my paper badge for a real badge so there you go even though it didn't have the software on it and maybe i'll try to get the software at some point and load it up yeah well, that's cool yeah i know they they go through a lot every year to get those uh you know to get a new challenge every year it's like a ctf in a badge you know you have to go through and and uh you know solve the puzzles and figure out the clues and uh there's always a write-up or two you know uh on websites about those and i actually saw the um the ctf the defcon ctf uh they released a vm of like the last seven years of uh, CTFs in uh, in a in a VM format. So you download this ISO, and it's basically got all the the previous seven years in a in a in a in a nice handy bundle. So if you wanted to do ones like you haven't done them before, then then you have the ability to to do those. So yeah, that would be uh, excellent practice to do ones from the past. Oh yeah, you know it, it's just like taking a class, right? You you do your homework, you study the practice exams or whatever, and then you're more prepared for the real test. If you ever want to do a mm-hmm. CTF at at DefCon, well, that's the best place to start is the the ones from the past, right? Yeah, so exactly. They exactly. might be indicative of future ones, right? Because it's yep. it it more than likely it's the same people that are going to do next year's. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, that- that that remo- that kind of brings us uh, to our own topic, isn't it? We we did a CTF of our own. Oh yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, it seems like uh, I don't know when did we end that? Like middle of last month. Yeah, it's just taken us a little while to get to it because of the hacker summer camp and everything. 
But uh, uh, our winner, actually, and our, our other winner, we actually had two winners of our CTF, uh, only one official winner, but he wanted to do a blog post on how he figured out the majority of the, uh, the CTF. So uh, I told him to wait until we'd done the podcast to do our write-up of our CTF, uh, and he agreed. So um, uh, we appreciate for him waiting. So um, <clears throat> we had – so a little intro – Last year we did a uh, um, a DerbyCon ticket giveaway. We gave away, I think we gave away two tickets last year as well. Um, and we wanted to do a CTF last year, but we just didn't even know where to start. I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, poor planning on our part. So you know, we were like, well, we won't do that again this year. You know, next year we'll do much better. We'll actually plan for it. Well, we we planned a little bit for it. Um, and you know, we had an idea of where we wanted to go and how many steps and, and, uh, you know, our, ours wasn't a, uh, I don't think ours would be called a, a CTF. Could you, could you call it a CTF or was it more like a scavenger hunt kind of thing? Uh, yeah, more like a scavenger hunt kind of thing. I mean, yeah. you know, sometimes life gets in the way, right. And you, uh, you plan on things and it, it, it takes a little longer or it's not as good as you hoped, but yeah, we, um. We came through, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it was over the course of about, I don't know, about six or seven podcasts where we were releasing these things out. And we, you know, I was surprised at the amount of turnout we had. We had about 15 people in the in the final uh, the final stages of the CTF, um, you know, and I, I, I think it was a I think it was a wide enough um, uh area of expertise i mean you needed to understand you know file types you needed to understand uh metadata you needed to understand some encryption ciphers um you know we have some lessons learned of our, on our own um but you know we wanted to just go through real quick and, and talk about the five stages that we had done uh and some things that we wanted to do but couldn't actually you know well i couldn't get them to work mr betcher got them to work but i i didn't so um <clears throat> So we had five stages, and the first stage was relatively easy. If you listen to our um, our 2016 uh, number 17 uh, podcast on networking and, and education, and we started talking about the podcast uh, at the very beginning, if you just go into the the, uh, the properties of the of that podcast, you will find a URL that pointed you to a Google Doc, because. Uh, the other the other requirement was we didn't want to spend a fortune on this this CTF. We didn't want to like make badges and stuff. We didn't want to spend a lot of money. Um, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, that that just sent you to a link to a Google Doc. So that was that was that one was relatively easy. And then we waited a little while for every you know to get enough people to show up to it. And and um, the the second leg of the podcast was when we were talking about. Uh, we gave a clue in the podcast talking about uh, John Wayne movies. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember that one? Yep. So, uh, the John Wayne movie that everybody had issues with was uh, was it The Quiet Man? I think it was The Quiet Man. Let me, let me double check that because we wanted to we wanted to get actually we did the CTF for kind of selfish reasons we wanted people to listen to the show uh you know and and then you know if you really wanted to go to DerbyCon then you could do that yeah it was okay so we talked about the quiet man uh we talked about a, a John Wayne movie that had a character in it that also had the name of a cipher and if you go to IMDb uh and look on some John Wayne movies the quiet man had a character by the name of Reverend Playfair and uh, on the Google Doc there was a um, a clue to the the Playfair you know to, to the to the cipher that you had to solve on the day that we told you it was going to happen I pasted the cipher text of a Playfair uh, cipher with the quiet man being the key that you needed at the beginning of the of the cipher to to be able to figure out the answer so that one was relatively easy. The only thing we got wrong on that was, uh, I think we had mentioned in the podcast that it had won an Academy Award when in fact it had just been nominated and there was nothing fancy. So, um, Mr. Betcher, I think you had stage three. Oh, yeah. 
yeah. was that the um, the one where we gave a hash? Yeah, that was out, the one with the hash. And yeah. and so the 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 hash was also the clue, or the yeah. path, and and it was also the password, right? Yep. Yeah, it was. Yep. Yep. So what? How did? Uh, how did? How was that the clue though? What did you have to do to make that happen? Well, the the um, the password was also a clue because it was a hash. Now you had to find out what the hash belonged to, and the way you could do that was go into Virus Total and plug in the hash, and then you would get the name of the file. And it just so happens that the name of the file um, was a steganomic steganography program. Okay. So okay. So there you go. And yeah. uh, I'm not sure. I don't remember how. Oh, okay. So if 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 you're dealing with steganography, then you need some kind of a file, right? Either mm-hmm. a picture or a, a video or a sound file, right? Yep. So we deal a lot in sound files, MP3s. Oh yeah. Yeah. So so that was it. You you download the podcast and you can use the hash, not only to find out what tool tool to use, but for the password. Right, and your clue was embedded yep. in the MP3 of the podcast itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and um, you actually had to submit the the steganography software to Virus Total as though it were a Trojan, right? Well, because no, it didn't uh, exist in Virus Total to begin with, right? Because um, they had generated it; they had just generated a new version or something like that. Um. um so yeah, I uploaded it to Virus Total, and then when you put the hash in, it it wasn't a Trojan or anything like that because Virus Total has good files in it too. So if you have a file that's questionable, you can upload it to Virus Total and, and see if it's, you know, been vetted or or not. So I chose a steganography program that um, actually there there was a program that I preferred to use, but they generated new new versions every time you download it, which was kind of weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I didn't choose that one. I chose one that had been there for a while. So if you okay. uploaded it to Virus Total, um, it was a little bit older. So so again, you you kind of trusted it because it yeah. was there, and then you could use that. And then I had to find one that actually, you know, had the hash in Virus Total and uh, was able to to fit in the password field because uh, like a SHA-256 might not fit. I think I think we ended up using SHA-1 or MD5, so I don't remember. It was a few months ago. So Yeah, and and the other thing was uh, when we were mangling the MP3, one, it had to still be able to play as an MP3, and two, if there were any kind of encoding issues, I didn't want it screwing up like iTunes or, you know, Google Play Store, you know, people being able to download and listen to it or anything like that. So whatever we had to do had to be non-destructive to the MP3 itself. So that uh, that was pretty cool. I, I I actually got that one and made that one work. That one was was fairly good. So um, once once that worked, uh, I think that one I think that that flag lasted all of about uh, I think it was about uh, two days on that one, which was good. I mean there was it was about two days went by before somebody had actually mentioned that, and I think you can still find it. Um, that was in our DNS sinkholing uh, podcast when we talked about DNS sinkholing, uh, the twenty third episode of this year. Um, uh, so we uh, we waited a while for stages four and five because I was like, well, you know, I think you know by that time I think we realized we'd started the the CTF a little too soon. Um, we'd started it almost immediately after uh, the the tickets went on sale. Um, we'll, we'll wait next time until people start getting desperate and then wanting to start to play. Uh, cause, uh, I'm actually now getting emails about, Hey, is the CTF still going on? Now I understand how, you know, Dave Kennedy feels about the, the talk, the talking list, how he was like, you know, people are asking him, uh, you know, questions even after they'd sent the emails out. So, um, <clears throat> so stage four and five, I thought was going to be great because, you know, Mr. Betcher, he's like, hey, we'll do a polyglot and we'll make it, you know, make it all cool and everything. And I was like, I don't I don't even know what a polyglot is. So I had to do research on what a polyglot was. And uh, um, you actually got it to work. And for those who don't know what a polyglot is, could you maybe explain what that is? Well, a polyglot kind of merges a couple of files together. Let's just, for the sake of... Um 
simplifying it, let's just say you're able to concatenate an image file and an MP3 file, right? So uh -huh. if you if you name the extension MP3, then it'll play as a as a um, soundtrack. If mm -hmm. you name the extension MP4, it'll play as a video, but it, but a different video, right? Yeah. So you take yeah. two separate files, merge them together, and based on the extension, it'll open up as whatever the extension was. So that's what a polyglot is, and you can, um, like, you can merge like a text file with a JPEG. They, it's the same file. You just name it differently and open up with a different tool. So, so there you go. That's what a polyglot is. Uh, they have it has the same hash, so you can have two files that have two different names. Uh, you open them up, and they have two different things in them, but it has the same hash. It's it's okay. the same file. Yeah. And, and we, we tested this. We actually got it to work initially with just uh, a text file and an image file. We couldn't find one exactly that worked as an MP3 and uh, like a text file. Um, ideally, again, uh, it had to be non-destructive. The MP3 had to play, you know, couldn't get mangled when it went into iTunes or, or what have you. Um, we finally found a program that did that, right? You, you found a program that would actually take the MP3 and the, the text file, right, and, and make no, that work. No, that's it. It was manual work. You had to open it up in a hex editor and actually oh. merge the two files together, right? So how, how did, okay, how did you do that in a hex editor? I was just trying. Okay, so maybe that was the the issue that I had. I was just trying to concatenate them together, and that didn't work. <laughs> Right, so you had to you had to be careful and merge them in the right place and in the right order. Okay, right? So, so that so I was screwed. Okay. Yeah, you got to you got to get down to the binary level uh, most of the time and and make sure you put them in the right spot in the right order. So okay, so I've seen um, I've seen a polyglot of like four, maybe five different files. Yeah, well, okay. five different types of file all in one file. And wow, that was pretty cool. But that took some work, right? It took yeah. a lot of work. And well, uh, he, it's, it's not my thing, but, but I was able to get two of them and put them together. So, yeah. Well, uh, okay. Here, here's my, here's my thing. What good is a polyglot for? What good is it? Well, yeah. you know, maybe, um, you're trying to slip in a, a video as a text file. It's, mm -hmm. it's just some obfuscation, right? It's not, it's not really, um, you know, it might fool somebody. Yeah. Into thinking, hey, I'm, it's, it's just a text file, right? But it ends up yeah. being a video or something, right? Well, could, could, okay, or so. it's just a picture, but it has text in it, right? Yeah. Could you take a, could you take a picture of something, say, cat, cat video or cat picture, take a, a web shell or something, embed it in as a polyglot, and then, you know, somehow have the file uh, get renamed to .php or .exe and then automatically you now have a cat picture that is already, you know, an executable. That it would work, right? It depends on the standards of the program being used, right? Or the um, the uh, CFP of the type of the file, right? CFP? Uh, or RFP, request for comment. RFP. RF, okay. RFC. <laughs> RFC. Okay. Yeah. All right. So whatever the standard is, right? So it, that it all depends. You just you can't could use that to concatenating them. You have to do it in a particular way, and it has to, you know, and, it, and they have to be compatible with each other to be able to do that. Right. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, that's that's why I fail. Okay. So what happened was Mr. Betcher's like, oh yeah, you can do this. Just open it in the hex center or whatever. See you later. I'm going on vacation for two weeks. I'm like, oh, man. You know, I'm supposed to, you know, have this out and I've got like three days to figure it out. I spent two of those trying to figure it out. And, um, you know, he was like, oh, yeah, contact, you know, let me know. I'll be in the middle of nowhere, but, you know, I'll still have Internet. And I was like, yeah, I'm not going to bother you with that. Um, that was something I really wanted to do. And maybe that's something that will show up next year uh, in next year's CTF. Um, um, but, yeah, we had... We had about fifty. We had about twenty people waiting for stage four, and I wanted to make sure it went out, you know, on time, which was like uh, Monday. It was like Monday. Yeah, it was like sometime mid July. It was the fifteenth of July, so it went out fifteenth of July. 
and uh, I, you know, I was trying to, you know, get that out on time. And I said, well, you know, no, the 11th, I'm sorry, the 11th. So I was, you know, wanted to get that out on time. So I decided, you know, to table the idea of the polyglot until we, you know, could figure that out. Um, and I wanted something that, you know, I could do myself because I didn't want to have to worry about, you know, calling up Mr. Betcher and having his wife get mad at me because they were on vacation and he was trying to do work. So <clears throat> I had done some, uh, war games, uh, online. There's online war games like, uh, over the wires, a good one. If you're wanting to, you know, learn various concepts or topics or something, um, good for write-ups if you wanted to learn how to do write-ups. Those are fairly easy to to do write-ups for. Um, and I had had gotten the idea into my head of there was one exercise on one of these CTI uh, war games that I'd done where it was a file. You got a file and it was a text file, or at least it looked like a text file. Um, you try to read the file and it's gibberish. So you had to learn about the file command. So file and then you type the name of the file and it will tell you according to whatever the hex at the beginning of it is what type of file it was so um you know there one of these exercises has you go through about oh, five six iterations of you know various tar files and bz bzip files and exe files and jpegs and everything and i'd gotten it into my head that um you know i'll take a picture of something fairly famous like uh you know uh someplace that nobody knows about you know take a picture of bletchley park for instance and I would, uh, you know, edit the edit the file and put a little, you know, run a little GIMP on it, run a run a a, a piece on it because I was gonna. The idea was I was gonna use the cipher text for the Enigma cipher uh, as the final flag. So uh, in the in the picture, I had put basically that if you look inside, you will figure out how to go to DerbyCon, and I typed it D E space R B space Y C space O N. And on the Enigma wheels, you had to, to set the, the, the various keys to, you know, put that in, uh, you know, to, to decipher the, 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 the cipher text. So <clears throat> I thought I was all slick and everything and with this picture of Bletchley Park that, you know, I didn't think anybody would figure out. And uh, that, that stage four was solved in about, I don't know, 30 minutes. So I was feeling real smart that day. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, everybody apparently knew what it was except for me because I've never actually visited there. It's on my on my bucket list. But the other bad thing was I sent the email out about thirty minutes early because I was creating a draft and I had created the draft and I was like, okay, I'm going to save this and then let it go out thirty minutes later. Well, I'd accidentally hit send thirty minutes before the the, the date the time it was supposed to go out. So I've got I'm you know I'm sweating bullets. I'm thinking, okay, great if somebody solves this. You know, before anybody else is supposed to get it, they're going to get mad at me. Thankfully, we we packaged stage four and five together. So stage four was unwrapping the file to get to the Bletchley Park JPEG with the, you know, the, the information on the front. And then stage five was the ciphertext that you got by opening the EXIF and looking at the EXIF data on the picture. So I actually, it did cost me $10 for this CTF because I actually had to buy an EXIF data tool because the command line EXIF data tool is just a whole hot dumpster fire of a mess that I was like, well, okay, I, yeah, I want to get this right and I don't want to screw it up. So I, you know, I took the PNG, I took the EXIF data on it and I, I put this huge cipher text in there that was an Enigma cipher. So the idea was if you look inside of this picture, you're going to get the, the key to go to DerbyCon. So I, I think some people overthought it, but it went for about two and a half days before uh, we actually had one winner. Uh, Tyler Hudak actually emailed me and said, hey, here's the here's the, you know, the code, um, you know, or here, here's the here's the instructions. And he was he didn't want to tweet it out because he you know already had a ticket and he said he was going to go anyway. So he already had a ticket and he was he wasn't worried about it. So the other guy um, actually reached out. Uh, he said that um, he used a couple of different websites before I actually found the right one. So uh, one one lesson learned is you can't always. I didn't use the most popular decryptor for the Enigma cipher, so that was um, that was something that got me, and I got a lot of other people too, because apparently there was uh, several more popular ones than the one I used. The same thing happened with the Playfair cipher. I didn't use the 
like Google number one searched for Playfair Cipher Decoder. So um, that that threw some people too. So yeah. But a lot of people seem to like it. I mean, I was explaining it to my CSEC East group the other night, and they were like, wow, I wish I had gone and done that, but I, did, I'm, I wasn't going to go to DerbyCon. I was like, oh, well, you know, you can still do it for fun. Yeah, that, that was the important thing. So Yeah, it's, uh, it's important to hone your skills like that, um, you know, by, by trying these CTFs and start small, you know. Start yeah. with uh, – um, I know I learned – a lot with the uh god what's the one with a wasp puts out um the, the what the one OWASP has for um um test uh, testing web apps oh uh it's not damn vulnerable uh well it's close, BWAP. Right. BWAP. Um, BWAP is or web goat web goat web yeah. goat yeah so i you know i did web goat a while back and and went through them all and you know you kind of learn how to do that kind of thing and and mm -hmm. uh it, it it's a good place to start and then you you can find harder ones and and get better and better yeah right so yeah you know, it's fun yep yeah those um you know i definitely learned quite a bit about uh you know file types and you know uh steganography bits and uh oh stage two so when you at the playfair cipher when you um decrypted it there was a, a thing that said hey you found the second flag woo pig and uh the way the playfair cipher works uh double letters often end up uh at least the double o's ended up as xx so a lot of people ended up because i used the wrong cipher website apparently they were getting like uh wxx pig and uh, they were like i don't understand what that means but I kind of gave every, you know, it was more than one person that had the issue, so I gave them a pass. But the the fact with the Woo Pig thing, my wife is a, uh, she went to the University of Arkansas, which is a, the Razorbacks, and they like to to call the pigs, you know, Woo Pig, you know, when they when they're in the stadium. So uh, I had to put something in uh, that was uh, I thought was esoteric enough that you actually had to, you know, be in the presence of the code to be able to, you know, give me that answer. So that was the other the other thing that came up. So. Um, yeah, some lessons learned that, you know, uh, make sure that it works, you know, make sure your ciphers, if you do those kinds of things, work on multiple websites, maybe use the most popular website instead of one that's two or three links down, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. especially for that Enigma one. I mean, we had people, I, I guess the most popular ones like this flash java html 5-ish thing where you've got like these these gears and you have to turn them and stuff and i was just using one that was about three or four links down that was you know basically just put you know two letters in in these boxes and it was gonna you know decrypt it for or, you know encrypt it for you so i was using something that was really simple and these people were using this really complicated thing that didn't actually do what that site did so um, yeah, one of the one of the things you want to remember when you're doing those kinds of things is that not every site will decrypt them properly. And since I, you know, my spare Enigma machine is sitting in my storage locker, um, I couldn't uh, gain access to it. So you know that there was that. So, but yeah, I um, you know, it was great talking to the people. You know, I didn't give out a lot of hints, and the ones I did, it was like generic. It was like you know, guys like, hey, I can't get this to you know decrypt or whatever. I was like, well, I you know, there is more than one website out there for that. That's about all I would say for people. I didn't give them any direct you know help but uh, it was nice that tyler hudak who has been on the show uh talking about malware and stuff he he really enjoyed it he said uh um that he would be interested in helping us next year with uh you know creating a ctf and i'm gonna hold him to that he's going to DerbyCon. and i'm gonna uh pick his brain about that a little bit but yeah i would love to to actually do a proper one maybe with a vm or something next year maybe we'll get more you know in depth fancy. and maybe do a yeah fancy error fancy more fancy ish yeah and make that work so wow sounds sounds interesting uh, and i hope it's um you know i hope Wait. people had fun and and we'll look for a bigger challenge next year right yeah yeah and you know we promise not to screw you over if you were stuck at you know st stage three and couldn't figure it out so um but yeah uh can, the actual guy who won his name was scott uh scott m so uh yeah we uh he he won so uh congratulations to scott for doing so um 
he uh, he hasn't gotten his ticket yet because I hadn't sent it to him, but uh, he definitely will. Uh, we'll be getting that in the next few days. So, um, <clears throat> so is there anything else, Mr. Brett, you'd like to talk about? I actually have a, a something that came up in the news today that I uh, I wanted to to discuss a little bit about operational security. But if you've got something else you'd like to talk about or um, something you you'd like to to discuss i would love uh, for you to do so no oh, i mean the 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 cons that i went to the hacker summer camp it was a it was a good experience right a lot uh-huh. of people there um a lot of smart people i mean they had car hacking and hardware hacking and it's just massive amounts of stuff at defcon so uh-huh. um it, it was crowded but they're moving to a new venue next year so hopefully that'll that'll work out for the best and uh you know, it'll be a quarter century of DEF CON, right, next yeah. year. So so I don't know if I'll go. It, it, it all depends on my schedule and everything. But, uh, but yeah, it's it's something to behold, definitely. Okay, very cool. Yeah, um, I, uh, I, I think I'm going to at least try to maybe get a DEF CON ticket next year. Um, I may not go to, to Black Hat. Um, or yeah. you know maybe I'll buy a ticket for B sides and then and then just go to DefCon and yeah. So it's yeah. Uh, DefCon I believe is cash only at the door. You don't have to buy them in advance. Oh, that's good. So wait, how do you get your badge then? You have to pay cash at the door to get your badge. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, that's something to know, I guess. There's I, no I way to buy online don't think tickets at a limit. time. Well, see, I paid uh, about a month or two in advance because I. I was buying a uh, Black Hat ticket, Uh so I went ahead and got a DEF CON ticket at the same time. Oh, you can bundle? So you can do that, so Black Hat will buy the tickets from DEF CON and and Uh, give it to, you know, the people that attend Black Hat. Nice. Okay, I didn't know that. That might be something to do, too. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Okay. So, um, uh, this happened just uh, a day ago. As a matter of fact, so there's probably going to be more information coming out about it, but uh, you know, uh, it's August the 14th, Sunday, the August 14th. So the Olympics are going on down in Rio, Rio de Janeiro, Summer Olympics, and you know the the United States team has just been kicking a lot of people's asses in the in the medal count, and uh, you know there there've been a lot of stories about the Rio Olympics, the the preparations for it. Uh, you know, security involved. There's, you know, people were, you know, wondering why Rio was given the games because, you know, there's a lot of crime in the area. So one of the things the Rio organizers did was, you know, they beefed up security a lot. They put, um, you know, basically uh, armed, you know, military. They, according to the, the New York Times article I'm reading here, they said that the area around the olympic park and the athletes village looked like a military compound sometimes but uh there was a story about ryan lochte who was uh one of the olympic gold medalists and three of the u.s teammates they were held up sunday morning uh by a gunpoint as they were in a taxi so they're, they're also highlighting that there were other people in you know who were also uh, attacked two coaches for the Australia rowing team were attacked and robbed. Uh, the, some people uh, in the athletes' village actually was uh, uh, robbed of their vol- belongings during a fire drill. So um, it, it seems to me that that uh, people had a false sense of security, or they they assumed that their security was taken care of in a, in a foreign country and. You know, I, don't, I know that a lot of other countries don't have to deal with this, but as Americans, we're probably a higher target than most. I mean, you would agree with that, right? Yeah, I mean, the standard of living uh, is a lot lower there than it is here. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of people, you know, a lot of Americans go over there. They're considered the haves, yeah. right? And the, and the yeah. criminals there are the have-nots. And, and they, you know, they think, well, Americans carry stuff right yeah you you steal their yeah. wallet they're going to have something in that wallet exactly value. yeah and i you know i just think it's you know we we i have gone and i've traveled a lot actually i've traveled a lot more since i was out of the navy than when i was in it but uh there's a lot of times that i see 
people from obviously from America because they're wearing the don't tread on me t-shirts or you know the camouflaged US American ball caps you know these colors don't run t-shirts I mean you got some real people who just don't understand the idea of the blending in and I don't know if it's because they don't care or they just assume that nothing bad is going to happen to them wherever they visit um, you know I try to blend in as much as possible when I go to countries because one I don't want to be seen as a tourist even though I probably stick out like a sore thumb because I wear sunglasses a lot it's kind of a thing I do um, uh, I noticed in Italy when I went nobody's wearing sunglasses except me so I don't they automatically probably assumed I was an American anyway but I, I just think that a lot of people don't don't think about their environment when they are outside of what is comfortable which is the United States for the most part when you're walking around a city or down a street in the United States you don't expect to have a lot of issues you know it's not like um, I visited Morocco you know for a day and a half once and um, you know I was very I hate to use the word cognizant but I was very cognizant of the fact that I was in fact in a foreign country and people were not thrilled some of them with the fact that I was there so I didn't do a lot to attract attention to myself you know I didn't wear you know things that proclaim that I was an American or you know you try to keep those things low-key and I think that's important and I think I think that's a kind of a hacker mentality too when you're when you're breaking into a network you don't want to proclaim that you're there you, you you don't want to hey look at me I'm here you try to keep that low profile you try to keep see how I did see what I did there with the the whole bringing it back around you know I did <clears throat> Yeah, well, you know, it's it's, it's helpful. So, um, do, do you do a lot? I know you do a lot of driving with your family. Have you ever? Have, do you travel a lot to foreign countries? Have you ever, you know, been to Canada or Mexico or, you know, elsewhere? Very little. Yeah. Right. So, just hey, there's a lot to see in this country. So I'm trying to show the family, you know, go as many places as we can here. Um, but yeah, occasionally outside the country, but there's, yeah. you know, I'm not going to take a trip to, um, you know, Rio de Janeiro for vacation. Yeah. Um, there, there are very nice places there and, and there's a lot of nice places right next to the slums. Sure. Right? Yeah. You know, so, yeah. so you, yeah, you have to be careful. Yeah, you know, and I think that uh, I, I think, and, and the thing was, I don't know if they were where they were when they were attacked. If they were, because it looks like that they had set up like a, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, there was a green zone uh, that you know the safe zone where you know they could be guaranteed, uh, you know, modicum of, of more safety than than they were. I don't know if they were outside of that. If they were you know, hanging out with, uh, with other folks in that area and they were just outside of where they needed to be. But, um, from what it reads, like they didn't take the guy who pulled them over very seriously. Lochte, as a matter of fact, wasn't going to, you know, do anything. The guy was being impersonating a police officer. So, uh, Lochte didn't actually comply until he had a gun stuck to his head. And then actually he decided to comply um, fortunately, all they took was his money and his wallet, they, but they left his cell phone and his uh, Olympic credentials. So, but all I could think of was, you know, this could have been very much more than just four U.S. athletes were robbed at gunpoint. This could have been four U.S. athletes gunned down in Rio de Janeiro, um, you know. Uh, yeah, easily. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It could have been a very bad thing. And I, I don't know. Um, they this is this is along with security awareness training. They were given a security briefing about things you should and shouldn't do in Rio. And it's obvious these four people didn't follow it or they thought, oh, this isn't going to, you know, this is not going to be a problem for me because it's not going to happen to me. These things don't happen to me. And when, in fact, it actually did. So, I mean, uh, again, we're seeing, you know, 
examples of you know training that wasn't effective for it may have been effective for say 80 percent of the people but you know there were still that 20 percent that you know it, it's never going to happen to me so i'm going to go ahead and do what i want to do anyway never mind the the consequences right and uh it has a lot to do with recon too right know your know your environment as well yeah yep exactly exactly so um yeah you know it, they when I was in the Navy and when I was government civilian, one of the things they required for you when you were going overseas was you get a State Department briefing to find out where you're going. So, you know, if you're going to Italy and France and something, they tell you, well, be careful. There's, you know, protests on the, the trains. You know, when we were in Italy, they had a socialist protest on one of the mass transit systems. And so, you know, nothing bad happened to us. I mean, they, they were just marching to wherever they needed to be, but it could have been much worse depending on, you know, if we were wearing something that was considered derogatory, you know, we may have been wearing green shirts and that would have been like, you know, the, the bad color that, uh, you know, the, the socialists don't like, and then we could have been made a target. So you got, you know, those, these kinds of briefings, you know, they need to be done. They need to be listened to. You need to understand them and you need to heed the advice of people who say, okay, this is the safe zone we've set up for you in the Olympic Village and, you know, the area between the Olympic Village and the Athlete Village, or these are the safe zones in Rio where you can go where you're not going to get mugged or, you know, you know, robbed at gunpoint. Don't go to these parts, you know, and, you know, and, you know, even if these are considered safe zones, always keep, you know, keep an eye on your, your, your environment, your surroundings, people who might be following you, those kinds of things. So you have to make yourself a hard target. You know, I, I just, some of these dudes are young and, you know, they don't get out much and I can understand that. So it just kind of bugs me that, uh, you know, this had to be a thing. So, right. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's some of it's their fault, right? Even though someone else was the perpetrator. Yeah. It was they who may not have followed the rules. Now, I, you know, I, I'm not in their shoes. I don't know what happened. Yep. But, um, you know, try yep. to do as much research as you can on where you're going. Like you said, do a debrief, right, with locals or whatever or law enforcement, you know. Um, yeah. I don't know what they went through, whatever kind of security training or, or anything like that. But, uh, but yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of times when uh when that happens some people put themselves in that situation yeah and you know depending on where you're living i mean you, you go through anti-terrorism training they tell you you know if you're driving a personal vehicle that you know inspect the vehicle before you get in the car because it's very easy for somebody to just drop a nice package up underneath the wheel well that's going to explode 30 minutes after you get in the car you know that kind of thing you you want to you know for me, I guess I've grown up with the the whole security thing being in the Navy and, and what have you. And some of these kids are it might be the first time they've ever been outside the country. Um, but, you know, it, they, they definitely have some blame in it. But, um, you know, we can only teach them so much. I guess that's... Uh, there's going to be some lessons learned for Rio as well and for the uh, the Olympic community. I'm just glad it, it was only, you know, they only lost some wallets and some money. So it could have been much, much worse. So And that happens here in America as well. It's like, That's true. you know, there's a dark alley. Do I want to go down the dark alley or do I want to play it safe and, and go down the main thoroughfare, right? So yeah. There's, yeah. there's that too. Yeah, walk through the dark, you know, walk through the dark alley or, you know, walk 500 more feet through a lit, you know, parking lot or something. Yeah, it's a it's a value judgment, I guess. It's a, you know, take your chances. Is this going to happen to me if I go this way? You know, it may not. But then, you know, what happens if it actually does? So, <clears throat> yeah, it's a it's all about risk analysis, I guess, in your head. And some people go by a different set of rules. So, yeah. All right. Well, I'm off my uh, off my soapbox. I, I just I I'd read about this at lunch when I was at the zoo with my family, and I was like, man, that's you know, I would hope that that never happened to me, but of course I don't take chances like that. So yeah. that's just me. Yeah. I guess it's uh, 
Yeah, maybe that's maybe that's my loss by not having adventures. You know, I guess they have a story now where this guy put a gun to my head. You know, it's, it's, I can laugh about it now, ha ha ha. But yeah, so. <clears throat> Well, all right, I'm done for the for the week, Mr. Betcher. Uh, how would how would people go ahead and uh, and get a hold of you uh, to talk about LogMD or to talk about what you're going to be doing at DerbyCon if you wanted to? Yeah, just uh, follow me on Twitter at BetcherPwned, um, and then we can DM each other or whatnot. And uh, if you're going to any conventions that that I'm going to, we can uh, you know meet or whatever and have a discussion. Awesome. okay all right hey um speaking of which are you going to be going to that uh that in tech thing that's in austin uh august 5th? is it like august 15th or... i don't know okay well i know that there's something going on the local issa branch in austin has a supposed to have a table or something but it's something called in i don't know so yeah i was just wondering if you were going to be going to that so <clears throat> anyway uh you can follow the official breaksec podcast twitter at Breaksec, B R A K E S E C, and uh, you can follow me. I'm uh, at Brian Brake on there. That's uh, B R Y A N B R A K E. Uh, oh, by the way, the the CTF is over for a DerbyCon ticket, but we do have a raffle for a ticket as well. If you want to join that, and since the the DerbyCon speaker list is out, and if you were supposed to be a speaker but your talk got rejected, you may need a ticket. So. Um, you know, it, the minimum it'll cost you twenty bucks for a ticket. It'll get which is an entry for the drawing. Uh, if you want to support us on Patreon, and we thank all of our Patreon supporters, if uh, you want to enter for a drawing, um, it's twenty dollars uh, for a month on our Patreon, or you can get an entry uh, every fifty bucks you donate to Hackers for Charity. So. We have a couple of people. They've donated 150 bucks to Hackers for Charity on uh, on the Hackers for Charity website, and then they send us the uh, receipt saying that they had donated, uh, you know, uh, you know, with their name and how much they donated. So every 50 bucks. So like our friend Eric here just donated 150 bucks to Hackers for Charity this morning because he had found out that we have a drawing going on. Uh, so yeah, just email us at, uh, you know, bds.podcast at gmail.com and, uh, we'll enter you into the, uh, the drawing. I think the drawing is going to be probably next Saturday, which would be the 20th of August. I think we're going to do that at probably around 5 PM Pacific. So, um, what we'll do is, um, take all the names and entries, which we have, um, Sonny, Tom, Trevor, Eric, and David and Michael, so far and uh, between all of them there's about uh, 20 entries so some people have donated quite a hefty sum to hackers for charity um you know we're gonna randomize those names and draw a name uh, you know, draw a name out of a hat and make that happen so uh, there's still plenty of time you've got another whole week to uh, decide whether or not you want to go to DerbyCon and and get your uh, your money in so um yeah so and then you can come and hang out with us i mean that's is that a plus? Is that a, is that a plus? It is if you're Mr. Oh. If you're hanging with Mr. Betcher, maybe not with me, but yeah. So. Well, you know, it depends on what you were doing the whole day to lead up to that, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I I I like uh, you know I'll, I'll sit down with a nice uh, nice hard cider or you know red wine and we can talk like we did last year. Um, you know, it was, it was definitely good times Derby con. Uh, yeah, so, you know, if you, you've still got plenty of time to get, uh, you know, flights and stuff to, to Louisville for that, which is, uh, a month from the 25th. I think it's on the 25th. So, <clears throat> all right. So we're on uh, Pat, we have Patreon, we have Facebook, we have a Twitter, we have, uh, LinkedIn, uh, we're on SoundCloud, iTunes. We have an RSS feed. All that information is in our show notes. If you want to go to www.breakingsecurity.com, uh, all that information is in our show notes. So, um, Mr. Betcher, I will. Uh, I'll talk to you again next week. You you have a great week, sir. All right. Bye bye. Okay. All right, everyone, have a great week. And we'll talk to you soon.